hello, thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Dean Tobias. Happy to be here. I'm from Chicago, if you can't tell. And I was asked to talk a little bit about Chicago and what's going on with the entrepreneurial ecosystems. So uh, a little bit about what I do. Um, I've got one group called Reboot Partners, and we help large corporations partner up with startups. And then we also help scale startups as well. One of them being Okta, which is a company I'm chairman of, which uh, was just acquired by Salesforce, also in Chicago. And then the last organization I thought I'd touch on today, it's called 1871. It's one of the largest digital incubators in the world. And we're going to touch on that a little bit. A little bit about Chicago. Not everybody knows a lot about it, but it's a fairly large city, fairly large economy. We've got about 9 million people, about $500 billion um, economy, bigger than most countries. So on a scale basis, it's a, it's a great place to do business. One of the reasons it's so strong, it's very diversified. A lot of huge corporations are headquartered there. So it's a nice thing to get used to. But as you can see, if you've got 400 headquarters and a lot of Fortune 500s, one of the things we've done as an ecosystem is learn how to leverage that. I thought I'd kind of take you back into time, though, and talk a little bit about Chicago when it wasn't so great. Way back in 1871, it was a thriving little town by a lake. Then the entire city burned to the ground. And the story of that great Chicago fire is really not the important lesson that we find people need to know about. It's what we did after that. Of course, I wasn't there. But the city came together and didn't just rebuild Chicago, but they brought together the best engineers, entrepreneurs, designers, developers, just builders from around the world to design the next generation of cities. Essentially, they even created the modern skyscraper. And that's the same kind of spirit we put together when we founded 1871. It wasn't about the fire, it was what happened next. Because we figured that if we just keep doing what we're doing, we could become irrelevant someday. Even in a big industrial city like ours, it's very diversified. So we opened it up only three years ago. It's fairly new. And um, we've got about 400 startups there. And basically we brought entrepreneurs, engineers, developers from all over the world again. It's not just a local play. One of the things we did not understand at the time was what kind of a magnet it became for people across the Midwest that wanted to come to 1871 to do things. World leaders, uh, CEOs of companies. When one world leader was there, he asked me, he says, how did 1871 become not so successful, but so impactful so quickly? Because they wanted to do the same thing in, in London and in other cities. And I said, one key term that I want to teach you guys today, I said, we have a lot of non-entrepreneurs. It's not just about a bunch of startup guys. You need some people that really aren't doing the entrepreneurial work to make it a sustainable movement, not just a short movement. So I got a little chalk and went up to the chalkboard and says, there's four types that I like in the non-entrepreneur category. We call them spotters, planners, builders, and most importantly, the sustainers. Many of you in the room are sustainers. So I thought I'd kind of talk about each one and let you know how they work. So the spotters are the ones that kind of spot the problem, right? It's like, hey, we've got a problem here. And in Detroit, it was a pretty obvious thing when their economy was crumbling, what they needed to do to rebuild their economy. So they focused on startups and some other things. In Chicago, not so much. We were fat, dumb, and happy. We had a great economy, things were going well. But we had this group that had been around the Chicago Entrepreneurial Center for almost 10 years, and we realized we weren't having a massive impact on the, uh, on the city. So one thing that we decided to do the spotting part was let's actually open up an incubator, a physical space, and let's just focus on digital only. Let's just do that and see what happens. It was a big risk, and it, it seemed to work for us. Second role is planners. It's not as obvious as it seems. Every city, every country, whether it's Helsinki or uh, Houston, Texas, has a different type of style. So those of you who've ever been to NASA, um, years ago, we cut back the program, laid off thousands of workers. So the smart thing for NASA to do was they got a local incubator to co-load itself in the Johnson Space Center so entrepreneurs could go there and develop new products and services using the technology from our best space labs in the world. And some cool companies have been developed out of that. It was just a kickstart to get things going, of course. Builders, I probably don't have to tell this crowd what builders are. These actually are the entrepreneurs. And Chicago is a very welcoming city. It's a global kind of gateway into the States. This is Stan. Stan moved his company from Russia to Chicago to start because he couldn't get a supportive ecosystem in the city where he lived. And he's doing quite well. So let's get to the last category, sustainers. These are ones I really want to encourage some of you in the audience to get involved in. So there's three that I love. One is mentors. Mentors do anything and everything for entrepreneurs. Sometimes they call us psychologists. 
So in our ecosystem in Chicago, we, we've really taken it to the next level. We've done about 10,000 hours of mentoring. Don't ask me how we count that. And we've built up a fairly large community of different groups that are actually in the physical space, like 12 VCs, eight universities, many dozens, quite frankly, of uh, global corporations that sponsor and help and keep it thriving and also education. In some cases, we're teaching people how to code. In other cases, we're helping them find co-founders. In other cases, we're just doing whatever they need to get started. Another favorite category of mine is connectors. Many of you in the audience are connectors. These are the ones, what do startups need the most? They need revenue. They need relationships. And in Chicago, we've been lucky because we got, went back again and leveraged all those corporations that are out there. But we're, we're smarter than that. We're leveraging them all over the world now. And I encourage anyone that's building an ecosystem, don't just think about the companies that are in your city. If you don't get them first, obviously, that's not a good idea. But leverage companies all over the world. You need people that kind of can leverage that connected tissue. The last um, group in the sustainer category is ambassadors. These are the, pretty much the, you know, the, the, the people that are going to keep that movement going. And they'll, they go out and do things like this and make sure that they, this is the difference between your entrepreneurial city being kind of a, a quick fad or actually a sustainable movement. And it's really an important role that all different types of people play. A Little bit of a background, here's what's happened to Chicago. Uh, while we were opening 1871 three years ago, there was a few incubators. Now there's over 50 co-working spaces, incubators, all that type of stuff. You need to grow with that, so we've expanded it and really realized how much it's kind of rippled through the economy and rippled through becoming a bigger piece of job growth, fundraising, and Chicago now has moved to a city that a lot of VCs flew over to a city where they actually come and invest now, very much like Helsinki. Wanted to shift the um, discussion now to more about startups and funding and what's going on out there. So something happened a couple years ago, if you remember back in 2011, unicorns started popping up across the landscape and no one knew what they were. Some of us call them overfunded companies, overvalued. But essentially, companies are valued over a billion dollars in valuation, making some public companies quite jealous. So that's interesting, three or four a month. Look what's happened in the last two years. Crazy out of control growth of unicorns, high valuation companies. And there's a little discussion there about the haves and the have nots. One analyst kind of put one of these uh, toilet paper rolls up on his blog the other day and says, this is kind of what's going on out there. They're just giving away money. But there's basically 143 unicorns, but looks what, look at what has happened in Q3. We've gone from a couple unicorns popping up a month to essentially every four days or so, you've got a new one popping up in the landscape. So that's good, and it's, it's, it's bad news for certain companies. For entrepreneurs, what I've noticed is there's a lot of kind of wannabes and copycat things going out there. When I travel the world, people say, I want to be the Uber of this. I want to be the... Um, you know, the Keurig of that. I want to essentially be the um, Airbnb model of this. And that's all great, because tr they're trying to kind of copy and mimic the sharing economy and the on-demand economy. If you look up here in the slide, technically, if you're living in the right city, I can, order I can order some marijuana, have it delivered to my house in 10 minutes, and if I time the food delivery just right, it'll kind of work out perfectly. So, I just encourage entrepreneurs just don't just try to copy what's going on in every other city around the world. Think of things, you can stretch things to the next level. And the last thing I really want to congratulate everyone on funding is, unlike in the past when Silicon Valley was one of the only participants, Europe is really coming on strong in terms of getting their fair share of financing. But let's shift now from startups back to corporations. Here's the dismal view that many corporate CEOs are seeing. The average lifespan of an S&P has gone from 60 years down to 12. Some say it's less than that. They're worried about extinction. The company might not go out of business, but they'll fall off the fortune list. And that's something they don't want to do. So one of the things we encourage companies to do, both at 1871 and around the world through this program we have called Dancing with Startups, is to partner up corporations with startups. And every question I get, even backstage today, is why don't more companies do this? And it's pretty simple. First, it's hard work. The second thing is, it's basic science. Startups like hanging out with startups. I mean, look at us all here, right? Big corporations, they like to party with each other, like this conference down in Cannes a few months ago. And the two don't always get together too well. Corporations love to spend billions of dollars on innovation training, and after all the money has been added up, they're still not very nimble. But there's two views that I, I, I worry about. 
When I bring a startup to a major corporation, this is what they're thinking before that startup shows up. They're kind of scared. Who is this little entrepreneur telling me what to do? The startup view isn't much better. I'm a little mouse that's going to get smashed by the next quarterly earnings, and these guys are going to lose interest. So they're really coming from diametrical fields, and we try to get them together into a kind of a magical space. One of the ways we do that is help large corporations figure out not just how to act like a startup, but how to kind of hang around them more and actually do business together. So there's probably 10 ways you can do it. These are our four favorites. Embedding entrepreneurial talent inside corporations. Separating some pieces of the company from the mothership, either in Silicon Valley or some diff distant place, even if it's down the street, for gosh sakes, but getting out of the corporate environment. The third one, our favorite, is partnering with startups. And the top right is where every CEO wants to go. They just want to buy a, a company. So I'll take you through what some of those look like. 3M and Google have gotten a lot of credit for letting people have enough freedom to kind of analyze, hey, what are the things out there that we should be building? Um, not everyone can do that. Not everyone has the budget that Google has. But giving your employees some latitude to kind of investigate things is important. This is one graphic of today I have a, a consumer products company here meeting with startups, and we are going through each room in the house and looking at startups that are attacking those business models and seeing if they're friend or foe or we should partner with them. It's as simple as breaking it down like that. Second part of the grid is separating from the mothership. A lot of people have moved to Silicon Valley. It's kind of an old thing to do now. Big companies set up an old office there and try to act cool. But if AT&T can go from an old Bell Labs to a, a labs where anyone can go in and build apps, anyone can do it. And these partnerships don't have to be these kind of like funny little marketing things. These are serious, hardcore, sometimes rocket science kind of stuff. And we literally sit down with the large companies and the big companies and say, it's not about just getting you together. What's the business model that we're going to work out? So as we start vetting companies to get together, we kind of vet for what the real business model is going to be, how do we partner you up, and then we finally get to what's the financial terms. And in some cases, these companies don't even have to put money into the startup. The clout that they bring is probably more important than the money they could put in your pocket. Here's a real, I love this example because it's simple. Ikea said, hey, we want to kind of get into the art sharing business. People can rent a, 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 a beautiful painting and have it hung in their home. They went to a startup in Pittsburgh, said, let's do it through you because you're already doing it. It takes guts to do that. It's still a trial. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And the last box I'll bother you with today on the grid is investing. Everyone loves to do that. One cool trend that's going on is corporate venture capital, CVC, is investing more and more money than ever before. Salesforce being at the top of the list on many categories right now. They are great strategic investors out there that didn't really used to be so nimble. Even large corporations like Walmart are investing and then buying lots of companies. And some people criticize you know, the, the approach and how people get there. The, the interesting case about Walmart is, first they moved out and had an office in Silicon Valley, then they started partnering with startups, and that made them a better acquirer. They finally understood how you need to behave in that ecosystem. And if you look at any industry, there's a lot of car guys in the audience today. If you really dig in, you'll see that this is already happening. These are just some of the deals that are going on in the auto space where partnerships are going on. And at the end of the day, what happens to most companies in this room? You want to get to an exit. Well, guess what? Not all of you are going to get to IPOs. Matter of fact, I recommend a lot of companies skip the IPO and head for the exit. So it's a great reason to also be partnering in either getting money or doing deals with them earlier on in your, in your life cycle, because they could end up being your acquirer as those. I want to introduce you to one more term tonight. It's entrepreneur. So it's a little different from the previous one. This doesn't always work. A lot of things can go wrong. So back to the four square grid. Embedding entrepreneurial talent inside companies doesn't always go well. Some people want to get you fired. Some people don't actually want you there. If you separate and, and kind of move out to Silicon Valley or hang out with some startups, sometimes they're not well funded or the CFO kind of cuts it. The biggest problem we find in partnerships is the business models are out of sync. So we recommend corporations give startups more uh, money than they wanted and take less equity than they're actually asking for. Make sure it's set up for success. It's not a negotiation. It's a, it's a relationship you want to survive. And you all know about acquisitions. A lot of hidden agendas where we bought you for this, but we're actually doing that, and you don't get the value out of it. Two last slides I'm going to leave you with. Just many of you are kind of figuring out, how do I approach this? So here's what most companies are doing. Some of them I agree with, some of them I don't. A friend of mine likes to call the first phase a petting zoo. They take their board or their executive team out to Silicon Valley. I'm not a big believer in that, but it's a great way to get their awareness. Many people are here today doing the petting zoo phase. Many corporations are walking around in the audience, and that's great. 
that's cool, it gets them started. Tastings are essentially where you can kind of try something and do it for a day. Projects are more long-term, like it's a 10-week thing. So many of you are involved in Techstars. We run a program where I teach at Kellogg, which is 10 weeks as well, and allows corporations to work with entrepreneurs, or even students in this case, to work on new products, new services. And then the last one is what I just went through, which is if you really want systemic change, either startups or a major corporation, make it a multi-year program that is really part of your overall culture. Here's what most people in the large corporations think. I already have a corporate development group. They buy companies, Dean. Why do I need to even think about this? I go, well, that's not really enough. They say, well, we also have a corporate venture capital group. And they get to dance with startups. I said, yeah, they're really investing in them for strategic or just financial reasons, most of them. So there's three other things you should do. Figure out how to go partner with an accelerator or incubator in your hometown or in your industry. Give them money, make it a civic thing. Get your group kind of engaged in that process. You'll meet some good startups. And then two other things. Think about partnering with an accelerator or like Disney setting up their own. I recommend you actually partner with one at first. And it has a ton of benefits. You get some equity. You actually get some spillover of entrepreneurial talent into your company. And lastly, obviously, partnering with an incubator has a longer-term approach because you're in there for a couple years. It's not just a short-term program. And you get first dibs on companies. And you start to help kind of transform your, your culture, even if you've got the other two. And then the last thing I'll leave you with is just like 1871, where we have these four key roles, spotters, planners, builders and sustainers. I encourage all of you to think about these roles inside your company. Whether you're a startup or not, it's critical. So I really thank you, and I, I encourage any of you to just share your stories with us. Startups that have tried this and things aren't working so well, large corporations, well, we're just trying to kind of connect people and, and make the next generation of funding and growth work. Thank you.